Chiritiga on the vehicle? Um, so I would like to be the seventh person to thank our organizers because it is really great to be here. Um, and this today what I'm going to talk about is joint work with Lorenzo Sedun, who's not with us today. Um, <laughs> and I really wish he was. But um, it's pretty preliminary. We've you know, sort of got this general framework and we're trying to sort of figure out the basics of how everything works. So um, I'm almost guaranteed that I will say something that's inaccurate or turns out to be non-untrue once we've uh, actually figured everything out. <laughs> so I just want to say that in advance. And I also want to apologize to the physicists in the room for using the word fusion. But our other choices were, um, <laughs> yeah, we were coming up with names like yeah. amalgamated substitution tilings and stuff like that. And then we came up with fusion and it just sounds way cooler. So, so we're going with that. All right. So. <laughs> Say what now? Well, I do, how many of those do we have in the room? <laughs> it also, it's also, yeah, this is true. It's also kind of restaurant. That, um, okay, so um, I know a lot of you guys have seen me talk over the years. Um, I've spent a lot of time attempting to generalize the idea of substitutions of non-constant length to, to the tiling um, situation uh, because to me, you know, the, the having the inflate and subdivide rule, there's a lot to do there. It's a very interesting case, but it's not really like the substitutions of non-constant length. And so I've been looking over the years for ways ways to do this. So um, I mean, this talk is really going to be kind of a compare and contrast between the self-similar tilings and substitution sequences case and the sort of how we um, visualizing it in the, in the fusion tilings case. So um, I sort of think of, I think of self-similar tilings the way we sort of grow them as a sort of a cellular model. Um, so substitution. Things, um, you know, maybe you have a cell and it grows until it's too big and then it splits up into little cells, um, you know, maybe of the same type or maybe in a family of, of, of types. And that's really sort of what we're doing when we kind of inflate and subdivide the tiles. The tiles sort of come uh, um, where they didn't exist before. Um, so the, the, <laughs> the, I, I think of the fusion tiling idea instead um, as sort of an atomic model. So you have um, sort of atoms floating around. For me, those are prototiles, but they could be um, other types of objects if you wanted to. So you have some, some things floating around, and they decide to organize themselves into... Um, structures and then those structures are floating around and they decide to organize themselves. I know this isn't really how, again, apologize. <laughs> I know this isn't how it really happens, but, but you have to humor me. So maybe, you know, maybe, maybe you have a couple of different kinds and maybe somehow they, they stick themselves together to become um, larger and larger structures and ultimately creating um, some kind of some kind of larger structure. So in this paradigm, maybe you have a bunch of, you know, maybe you have a bunch of tiles floating around, and they decide, in this case, to organize themselves the same way as before. So um, the way I was visualizing it, and, and I, I want to point out that this is actually um, similar. I, I was I wasn't really aware. Um, the, the cut and stack people have sort of been seeing this sort of thing this way for, for quite some time, including Dan Rudolph has a paper, if you go way back and dig in the ergodic theory literature, you can find um, him talking about a sort of a, a ZD version that's um, a really sort of similar, where he's got, you know, the, the, as, as I do, you have sort of things happening in stages. So you have your basic objects, for me those are prototypes, you've got your your level one objects, you've got your level two objects, and things happen in stages. So that's the um, that's the sort of overall paradigm. Okay, so um, 
So let me be more specific. All right, so, so you have some finite set of prototiles. So those are your basic building blocks of your tiling. So you can, I don't care much about rules right now, so probably closed sets, maybe you want them to be connected, maybe you want them to be bounded. I, I don't know um, what the rules are, what the right rules are. Uh, but you've got some finite set of prototiles and you've got an isometry group um, G that you're going to use to move those prototiles around and create larger tiling. So that, and I want that isometry group, it has to at least include a full rank lattice um, so that I get it, I'm able to get a tiling of the plane. Um, and beyond that, uh, you know, maybe it has some rotations or reflections or, or whatnot in it. I, I don't, I don't know. So this, this paradigm is intended to include, you know, really symbolic sequences, right? If I use, if G was just Z and I was looking at Z, um, all the way up through um, as complicated of a group as you want to make it. Okay, so, um, so a patch is going to be, um, is going to be a union of prototiles. Uh, well, copies of prototiles that intersect only on their boundaries. I, I know that probably most of you guys are familiar with this terminology, but um, and um, so here, when I say copies of, I mean moved by elements of G, possibly. Um, so, right, this is a patch of tiles. Um, so, um, a fusion, I'm calling it, basically fusion of patches is just concatenation in some geometric way of patches. So a fusion of two patches is um, the union of those two patches. Is, is a patch, I should say. Formed by their union. And I probably want to require um, that patches be connected. Uh, no, no. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely want to be, to be tiling. Yeah, so if I have, so, and you're thinking like I could take one of these and even intersect it with one where maybe it just overlapped on this tile. I'm not going to allow that. They have to be this time. Um, okay. Okay, so here's a fusion rule. All right, I'm going to attempt the, the dangerous maneuver of switching the boards, which I have succeeded at doing. All right. Um, all right, so here's a fusion rule. So. All right, so your, your P naught, so I'm going to make a list, a list of list of patches. <laughs> so P naught is my prototile set, and I'm going to use the notation but, So those are my basic objects. So my second list that I write down, P1, where these P's are supposed to be script those are supposed to be not script. So that'll be P1 of 1 up through P1 of J1. So this is already you can see um, a difference from the substitution case. The size of the prototile set is not necessarily the, the size of the level 1 um, tile set. So these are, these are 1 super tiles. And the rule is that these guys have to be fusions of guys from this level. All right, so when I go to make my two super tiles, the idea is, um, again, it's just a list of patches. Um, and here, 
the two super tiles have to be fusions of um, patches of, of one super tiles, right? And so we continue. And so you create larger and larger um, patches, hopefully, <laughs> um, that um, are related to one another. So P, so PN, so I think you could probably write down what PN is. <laughs> um, and um, where, where the, um, so where the patches in PN are fusions of patches in P N minus one. Um, so just to have, so what does that mean? <laughs> Right, so you could, yeah, so I, I spent some time thinking about the question of do I always only go one back, but you can kind of fake it and go several back. You can also, so I am making, I'm, I'm not making lots of rules because I'm not yet sure what the right rules are, but um, I am going to require that these are non-empty, and I'm also going to require that they're always finite, each list is finite, it could be very large. Um, it, it is convenient to do that for sure. So, um, so I sort of we've written up, you know, some results, and you have to make this requirement or that requirement. And I'll say some of them, um, and in fact, I should say one of them uh, right now, except where's my piece of paper? All right. So um, let's see, maybe up on this board. Um, okay, so what does it mean to be admitted by um, the rule? So an infinite filing of RD is admitted by the rule if every patch that I might see in the tiling appears somewhere inside a patch from this list. No, this, um, sorry. Um, okay, so if all of its finite patches um, appear inside some super time. So everywhere you look, anywhere inside the tiling, you see um, things that look good. So in fact, if, if at least some of the patches aren't increasing in diameter, um, nothing will be admitted by the rule. So you, it's, it's possible to have a fusion rule that doesn't have an associated um, hull, essentially. And we ignore those. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, so the fusion tiling space um, XR is obviously going to be the set of all tilings admitted by the rule. Formally, this is a fine way to think of it. Um, the, no, actually, these are all finite patches of tilings. So none of these are infinite tilings themselves. So, I mean, the, the, so, so essentially, I think you have to be a little careful, but I think this is a fine way to think about it. Yes. Um, 
There might be. That is something that can happen, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so I may decide to make up, when I make up a rule, I can sort of choose to let that happen or not let that happen. I can encode that inside of the rule. So um, let me show. Okay, can you still hear me? Um, okay, um, so um, let's see here. So the um, some examples, and these examples aren't great because they're all sort of motivated from um, existing. So they're good because they're motivated from existing things, but they don't really show off the full generality. But I'm gonna just to keep you grounded. So for instance. Um, the Chacon uh, version of the cut and stack. All right, so um, maybe I have an A tile that maybe it's some interval, and I have a B tile, and maybe it's also some interval, and maybe they're intervals of length one. I don't, it's sort of, it doesn't really matter. Um, but if they were, I could let my group be G. Um, and then my list of patches would so p naught could be my prototile so just a and b really i should be drawing pictures of tilings but i'm going to write symbols instead um, so what should i write a a b a and then just b again and then p2 is two copies of a a b a b a a b a and so on down the line, right? So, um, so if I continue uh, generating these patches, um, then um, the, the tilings that are admitted by this would be exactly the chicane cut and stack tiles. Yes? Maybe, okay. Um, you're not nodding. I usually require my students to nod when I ask a question. <laughs> Make me at least think you understand me. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes. So um, everything, did I not mention this? Um, every substitution and self-similar timing rule is an example of a fusion timing. So this class in, encodes everything of the other things. So um, here, I'm thinking of this. Okay, so this one is a, so here's p here's p one of one, or yeah, well in my notation, and p one two. There's only two things. So this this p two of one is actually the fusion of of two p one ones. So it's the fusion of those things. So I'm not thinking of, so this is actually, when you did your talk um, yesterday and wrote down the Fibonacci, you actually wrote it down as a, as a, as a fusion rule instead of as a substitution. So you were, you wrote down, um, you wrote down this, where A1 was actually this. So you're, you actually already had this paradigm in mind when you did it, which is why you're saying, what's the difference? <laughs> right. Which is, which is why I knew it was dangerous to start with substitution examples. Um, if you were going to write a computer program that generated these, um, if you were going to generate it by substitution, you would include the inflation factor, and then, um, so if you were going to maybe make a substitution algorithm to draw the, the pinwheel tiling or something, the existing algorithms use the inflation map to figure out where the tiles should be, and then they divide up the inflated tiles, right? If I was going to write um, computer code to draw the pinwheel tiling, which I have written, 
and I did it this way, um, I generate the level one tiles and then generate the level two tiles by sticking the level one tiles where they go. It's, it's a, so I don't think of the tiles as having grown and subdivided. I think of them as coming together from wherever they were and clumping into the next thing. So, and it turns out it's, it's, it allows you to do, um, well, <laughs> this tells me that I should definitely not use. <laughs> All right, let me make up another one. So this one is, don't even, all right, so maybe there's my prototype set and maybe at the first level, I decide to have that. Right, so in this case, G would be, um, sort of a, a semi-direct product of R2 with uh, D4. Yeah. So this is a nice one because the transition matrix is always the number four if you do it this way, which I think is not very useful. Um, but, oh, I'm not going to have, all right. Um, and you could, so you could generate the regular um, chair tiling by doing this if you wanted to, um, or you could just make up some other random thing, which I have no idea how to continue this list, but just pretend it continues. So maybe, maybe I decide that at the first level I'm going to have that patch, and maybe I'm also going to have that patch. All right, and maybe at the second level I decide that I'm going to have, um, oh, I don't know, Maybe I'm going to have that as one of the, whoops. Maybe that's one of my patches and maybe, um, I don't know, some, some other thing, whatever. I can't promise this list continues properly, but I can, so, and it shouldn't have two things. I, let's, let's say I put, Maybe it has three things. I could put as many things as I wanted. So suppose, so from each, each one of these is a fusion of ones from above, right? Where there's no real geometric relationship in between them. Um, and there's no, there's no particular um, relationship between um, how many tiles there are at any given level. All right, so there's really literally no rules as far as how I want to stick these things together. The only rule is that the list has to be finite and has to be made up of stuff from the previous list. That's, that's it. Um, you may want to make more rules and that, that makes a lot of sense. And I thought, I want, to put, I want to put an example. One of the main things I thought of early on is what I was calling direct product variations. And so I might as well show you the Fibonacci one. Um, you've got four unit square tiles. Now you could just do a plain old um, direct product um, or you could do a direct product and mess it up a little bit. and um, continue concatenating the blocks in the basic order that I've listed there. Um, and this is very much like a self-similar rule, and in fact, it's asymptotically self-similar, so you can go between in a way that would be impossible um, for one that's like this. But, um, so that particular example has shown up in a couple of different things. Okay, so, Oh, maybe for that one I do. 
usually I would be a little more careful, but I was trying to make up a random looking thing that didn't remind you of a substitution. <laughs> I could just ignore it, right? I could have the next thing just be made up of these and make a periodic time. So there's no, nobody said you have to use every single one of them at the next level. And that, that, that speaks to issues of sort of primitivity and so on, um, which I should probably get to because I must be supposed to end at some point. Um, okay. All right, so key constructs and ideas. So, I wonder which way this one wants to go. There we go. Okay. All right. So, um, So like I said, the, your basic substitution stuff is contained in the fusion rule. So if you make enough, if you if you make enough restrictions, you can get back to the substitution case. But so the, basically, we've made this definition, and now, you know, goal one is attempt to figure out how everything works for this case. Um, the sort of your, your existing basic stuff. How does it work here? Um, okay. So in substitution you have your transition matrix. And here, when I say substitution, I mean symbolic substitution or um, self-similar tiling type constructs. So, um, so in, in substitution, you have one transition matrix. If you throw them, you won't get your fingers hurt. That would be, when you do your talk later, you can just throw it hard and it'll go on its own. Um, all right, so you know the transition matrix and substitution. Um, so Mij is the number of tiles of type I in the substitution of J. Um, and so, in fusion, you have two. You need two kinds of transition matrices. You need, you know, you need the transition matrices that go from one level to the next, and then you need to concatenate them to get um, from one level to another far away level. So, um, so. So this is going to be the number of patches uh, Pn minus 1 of i in Pn of j. Right? So if you do, so this, I think sometimes people use the transpose of this matrix. Um, this is the way I like to think about it because if you do if you think about, if you do m sub n times a population vector of, um, of n supertiles. So if you tell me you've got a bunch of different supertiles at the level n, and you hit it with this matrix m sub n, it's going to give you a population vector of um, n minus 1 supertiles. Right, so it's going to take you from um, one level and tell you how many that's actually made up of. And so the the um, and it makes it easy to do these these transition matrices that take you from level n to level big N. You just do like that. So. Um, so that's how the transition matrices work. But of course, these guys are all, oh wait, I should have written. So this is a, um, so Mn is a um, 
J sub n minus 1 by Jn matrix. Right? It's, it's, there's, there's J sub n minus 1 super tiles at the level n minus 1 and J sub n. So these are all rectangular matrices. Okay? Um, or they could be rectangular. In the case of, of something like this example, they're always square. So um, there's some classes, subclasses of a fusion tilings you can look at. You can look at subclasses that are prototile regular, where you can sort of follow your prototiles along at each stage. Um, you can also have um, what we call transition regular, where at each stage the transition matrix is the same, but it might not be for the same prototile type. So you get it's just, the, the classes are really weird. Um, so the examples I gave are, are um, I think, both are regular, nice regular examples, which means you can look for asymptotic convergence of shapes and so forth. Okay, there's primitivity. All right, primitivity is key in substitution um, stuff because if you have something that's primitive, then you can apply the prone Frobenius theorem. It gives you the relative frequencies. Um, of all of your um, tiles. It also gives you the natural tile sizes if you want them. So primitivity is usually pretty key. We, we, we sort of, there's two levels of primitivity that you can see here. There's, you know, regular and strong primitivity. So what you need for regular, let me make sure I'm not getting this messed up. Um, you need for all n, okay, so All right, so primitivity is about making sure that if you substitute enough times, you see all the tiles from lower levels, right? So, um, so, so regular primitivity says um, for each n, there is an capital N um, such that uh, D, the transition matrix that takes you to li little n to big n, um, has all non-zero entries. All right, and strong primitive, so this says if you wait long enough, all of your little n super tiles appear in all of your big n super tiles. Um, and, uh, and strong primitivity is, just, just have all of your, have all of your go between the levels and just have them all be um, already have non-zero entries. Um, and if you have a, a regular, you, you might as well always assume that you have a strongly primitive fusion rule because if you have a regular primitive fusion rule, I think you can just conglomerate levels and get it to work. So that's primitivity. Um, one nice thing that you have in substitution that I have no idea how to generalize is the expansion constant. I've, I've put my mind to this a little bit. If anyone has some bright ideas, I definitely appreciate that. You know, there's no reason why it should have, but it might, and there might be a good way to look for it. I'm imagining that if you sort of, I mean, so what do you do? I mean, so the cheap way to get the expansion constant for substitution stuff is you just get the big eigenvalue of your matrix. But couldn't you somehow do a long-term average of the, you know, or some, or some such thing, and if you got lucky and things were lined up correctly, maybe you would be able to make sense of it. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, um, and plus, you know, and plus maybe the thing isn't even really expanding properly. So 
you know, maybe everything is getting infinitely long and skinny or, or some such thing. So, so this, this, I have to work on this particular box. Um, okay, so another nice thing you have for substitution rules is that substitution acts on the hull. I think I'll mention at this point that I have a whole nother chart like this on results that we know. Um, we won't be getting to that chart just today. <laughs> um, so substitution acts on the hull, right? Every every um, every self similar tiling or any any tiling in the self similar tiling space, you can inflate and subdivide, and you get a new tiling from the tiling space. Um, so we don't have that obviously, um, but we do have um, you have sort of a subdivision. A subdivision map you get for free. And the, <laughs> the subdivision map is um, so if you make the tiling space where you pretend that the end super tiles are actually your proto tiles. Right? So you just start at PN. Basically, you just erased everything on the inside. So if you look at that, um, then the subdivision map um, is the map that um, remembers what you've just erased. And um, so ideally, I would say more about that, but instead, I'll just say recognizability. In the substitution case, recognizability is equivalent to saying that the substitution map is invertible, right? So not only can I substitute any tiling in my space, if I look at a tiling in my space, I know what tiling it came substituted from. Um, so recognizability in the fusion case is actually kind of hard to think about, and I think there's, there's all sorts of weird examples that you can make, but essentially recognizability is going to be that this subdivision map is um, invertible. So it means that if you look at a tiling in your in your hull, you can figure out unambiguously where the level end boundaries must have been. Daniel, how, how long do you think that happened? Okay, well. Good, then that means that I have to, is, are people still happy or do they want to? <laughs> okay, but can I say one more, can I say one more property? Okay, the results are pretty, um, they, they're pretty like not shocking because right now we're, um, <laughs> We're trying to figure out, like, lay the basis of what works that already worked or when doesn't it work. So, for instance, I mean, I can certainly say that um, for substitution stuff, um, you can never get strongly mixing, but for fusion tilings, you can. For fusion tilings, you can get entropy where you couldn't before. And you kind of can say, and, and that stuff is, is um, you know, by regulating these matrices, you can regulate whether or not that sort of thing is going to happen. We also have sort of a technical condition for the presence of eigenvalues, but we haven't attempted to look at sort of the rest of the spectrum yet. So we're um, a fairly preliminary. That is, oh, you can use the fusion structure to um, see the timing space as an inverse limit and have a hope of doing um, some cohomology computations, which you know Lorenzo loves to do, and um, and and this sort of thing. So. 
So, so a lot of things. I was pretty surprised actually that the that the inverse limit stuff was going to go through nicely, but you made it work. Okay, but let me say one more thing that's actually kind of interesting. So finite local complexity. Um, so I think um, you asked me a question about the finite local complexity before. So, so finite local complexity is when you require that there are only finitely many um, ways that two tiles can touch each other. Okay, so um, so you can require finite local complexity, or you can not have finite local complexity, and that's um, all the results that we've worked on so far in the finite local complexity case. Because topologizing and doing everything in infinite local complexity cases is is, is hard. Um, there's so of course for fusion you can require finite local complexity, but there's also something. Um, that you can worry about called asymptotic finite local complexity. So, um, and that is when you have, um, all right, so asymptotic finite local complexity um, is when you say um, there is an N so that, um, so that there can only be no. have what have not I'll, I'm, I'm going to put an example in a second. Um, so there is some N, but okay, remind me to put the example in case I forget. Um, so there's some n such that there are only finite, or that ah, sorry, the number of um, two supertile patches. is less than n, less than or equal to n. This, I'm stating this really badly. Can I start again? <laughs> That's not what I want to say. All right, here's what I want to say. If you have two N super tiles, they can, little N super tiles, they can only fit together in less than or equal to n ways. So the number of ways that any pair of n supertiles can touch each other is bounded. So you can easily make an example of a fusion rule that's finite local complexity, but not asymptotic finite local complexity. So it's, and it's really basically the one that, from the paper that Lorenzo and I wrote, um, so you let, you've got two unit squares, and at the next level, you say A, B, B, A, and then you say, these are supposed to still look like squares. And then at all, pre, at all uh, levels later, you create, um, you concatenate the blocks. They're going to come out looking like this. Um, so this is um, and this one is just all A sub ends. So you're basically applying essentially the same rule at each stage. Um, and so this is based on a one-dimensional, oh, this is also an example where your group G, you could take your group to be um, something interesting if you wanted. Um, actually, this, sorry, this one is just R2, that means E2. 
when you give them the natural tile sizes, it's what it's our cross. Um, but so this is this is based on a symbolic substitution that has a non-piso expansion constant. And so what that means is that when like along this rift here, so the B tile is longer than the A tile, and along this rift, what's going to happen is that you sort of get this discrepancy in how many A's versus B's you see, and and so. Um, the number, the end result is that the number of ways that the B sub ends can touch each other goes to infinity. So, um, and the version of that that you can do, you can do this exact same thing. Um, so this is finite local complexity because everything is a square, so everything's always going to fit together as squares. But if you want to do a version of this um, with asymptot with, uh, without finite local complexity, just um, make the widths of the tiles whatever the natural tile lengths should have been for the one-dimensional substitution. So I think you know you end up with um, you could let one be a square and let the other be a rectangle where it's like the width is one and this width is one plus the thirteen over two, and it loses finite local complexity like pretty much. So does that answer your question, actually? Because you asked, um, say, I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Yeah, so um, say it again. No. Um, I have to have some n such that the number of, let, let me rewrite this again, little n supertiles, such that the number of ways two n supertiles can touch is less than or equal to, to, to capital N for all little n's. Now I've written it in a reasonable way. No. It comes right out of this rule. So if I were to redraw this rule, um, this particular one, um, as soon as I try to make this shape, I actually get they're not. It's just in my rule. Well, that's the first part of them. Yeah. So I can choose a rule to be that, and then I have to, if I stay consistently, you know, with this pattern as n goes to infinity, they're just, they, they just end up sliding. It just, it just happens. It's there. Yes. Yeah, so you can, yeah. Although if, you're, if your tile lengths are ret, sometimes you can accidentally get finite local complexity, even when the tile lengths are irrationally related, but yeah. But if they were, well, you could have them, say it again. Sorry, I'm not thinking well. What did you say? Yeah, you would actually still have, yeah, you don't need to, just any irrational number would do. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think that's um, probably good enough for now. People hungry for lunch?